So President Siler is going to be leading Bible study for us this morning. Uh, so thank you once again for being here and for delivering us God's word. How many of you were at the early service? How many are going to the late? Oh, uh, you're in for a treat in late service. Not to fill it up too much, but it was dynamite sermon. So, yeah. Just uh, hang the carrot out there a little bit. No? All right. Thank you, President Sutton. You're welcome. Test, test. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. All right. Well, I heard that, that alarm that went off. I didn't think that was the last trumpet, but I, I haven't heard the last trumpet, so I'm not so sure. Let's, let's hope it sounds better than that. Uh, well, it's so good to be with you, sisters and brothers in Christ, and yeah, the, the, in the earlier service, this uh, certainly fits in with that theme, and which is, you know, Christ returning, Christ raising the dead, Christ uh, giving us new and glorious bodies uh, based on the fact of his resurrection from the dead. So our study today, after I talk just a little bit about our South Dakota district, is going to talk more about end times, but especially about the gospel reading for today, Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 and following, where the separation of the sheep from the goats and uh, the righteous from the unrighteous. And so we'll, we'll get into that reading so you can find your way in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25, because that's where we're headed. So good to be with you, uh, friends in Christ, here at, at St. Paul's. Been with you once in a while uh, over the last five and a half years that I've been your district president, and always a, a happy experience to be with you. Now, of course, uh, some of that has to do with calls, and it's not always so happy, uh, you know, that you say so long to a pastor, but nevertheless, you know, the church goes on, doesn't it? I mean, we continue our work as the body of Christ, and uh, we're just so grateful to be able to gather around the Word of God and His precious sacrament, and then even to have Bible studies like this. What a, what a blessing to be able to do that. And so, so I live in Sioux Falls, Sarah and I, and my wife Sarah is back there in a, is that a blue sweater, Sarah? My eyes aren't so good. Yeah, dark blue, okay. Yeah, the husbands are all saying, yeah, that's the way I am too. Real sharp, we husbands. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so Sarah and I are glad to be with you, and it's just a, a gift to be able to travel around the state of South Dakota, visiting our 105 congregations. Uh, not that that gets done very often, but I do pop in here and there and everywhere throughout uh, South Dakota. And you do have a map. Uh, at least your table should have at least one map with the location of our various congregations. And I'm sorry we don't have more copies, but I thought, well, it's at least a, a picture for you to know where our churches are located. If they're connected with lines, you've probably figured out that that means they are a dual parish, or in some cases, triple point parish. We have several of those, and we have a brand new four point parish, Menno, Par um, Menno Scotland, Parker, Marion, all together served by one pastor. How about that? And so today, that's Pastor Brian Moseman, and I maybe should stand in front of the camera, although I look better on the other side of the camera. Uh, but Pastor Moseman, instead of driving all over creation to conduct four services a Sunday, instead he conducts two services a Sunday. One with Menno and Scotland together. Have you found Menno and Scotland? And then, and then one, he, then he drives over to Marion or Parker, where they share a service. So one week, the service is in Marion. The next week, it's in Parker, on the east side of that Four Point Parish. On one Sunday, on the west side, it's in Menno. And the next Sunday, it's in Scotland. So that's just the way they're doing it there. And so the Lord is coming up with solutions to you know, smaller congregations than they used to be. And uh, we have dedicated pastors who are serving two congregations, three congregations, and now even four congregations. 
And I, I want to really give you guys some kudos in that you, are, you have raised up from your midst Ray Anderson uh, to assist in this, really a shortage of pastors. And in, uh, you know, in the decline of some congregations not able to maybe have a full-time pastor, well, people like Ray Anderson from your congregation studying for the ministry, but already eligible to be in service to St. Paul Eola, uh, through the SMP program, Specific Ministry Program of our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. So I thank Pastor Bobby for mentoring Ray and for this congregation for raising up Ray as a, a pastor or an eventual pastor in the Lord's Church. Is that where he is today, Pastor Bobby? Serving the saints there. Okay. He preached one of his sermons today, too. One of the... One of his old sermons that he wrote. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. These are the sorts of solutions, different aligning of congregations and uh, raising up men like, like Ray to be in service uh, to God's people. Uh, so, just really want to commend this congregation for, for that. All right, and then you have another sheet that has more blue in appearance. And again, I apologize for not having as many copies of these as I should. But just gives you some statistics about who we are. Now, it says 107 congregations. Well, guess what? We, in just the last couple of months, have closed two churches. One near Brookings in the town of Aurora. That church, little church there, First English. So, I don't know if you want to cross off that congregation, you can on the map because it's true they don't exist any longer as a congregation, but it's also true that those folks, most of them are, are now going to be attending Mount Calvary, a Lutheran church in Brookings. So, first English Lutheran in Aurora, and then also St. John Lutheran in Emory. Emory near, uh, there near Mitchell. So, Pastor Christopher, who only had three congregations to serve before, <laughs> now has two, two to serve. So that's just the way it goes, not only in South Dakota, but also really in the whole region. Once in a while, our churches do close. And you have some other statistics. But then, now this sheet also gives you an idea of the ministries that we do together in the South Dakota district of the Lutheran Church in Missouri Synod. And so I don't really know what your mission offerings are to the district. I, I know that they are substantial, and I know that they are helpful, however. And yours, together with the offerings from the other now 104 congregations uh, in our district, well, we do these kind of things together. St. Paul's could not do this alone, sponsoring missionaries on the Native American reservations, right? But together we can do that. We can have a deaf minister in the person of uh, Pastor Matthew Nix. We can do some campus ministry uh, together, especially at USD and SDSU. And I know, I know that there is a little bit of campus ministry going on here at, uh, at Northern, too, and probably a presentation. So I just want to, to thank you for this partnership in the gospel, and this is just a little help, a way for you to know uh, what's going on as we do this together. Well, I want this to be a Bible study, but I do want to be able to answer questions that you, you might have about what we're doing together in the South Dakota District. I guess I should say that, uh, so for every dollar that St. Paul's gives for missions to the South Dakota District, okay, for every dollar, 67 cents stays in South Dakota and 33 cents is sent on to the International Center in St. Louis to to do work together as the whole whole synod, two million members, six thousand congregations together. All right, so that's uh, some little tidbits for you to know that you know this money that you send in that maybe you don't always know what's going on with it. 
Well, it, it is doing a world of good as we bring the gospel to uh, a lot of people through your offerings. All right, now I will stop and, and see if you have any questions. All right. Yes. Well, the offerings that we send to St. Louis then are part of the unrestricted giving for the Synod. So that's a part of the general budget use for the Synod. It's, it, it helps to uh, fund positions at the International Center. You know, we have uh, the head of the mission department, for example. You know, we would be helping to pay his salary. Uh, we are helping through those offerings also to uh, maintain our college and seminary system uh, to a degree. Uh, more and more, those colleges are, are not dependent on the offerings of congregations because there's simply not enough, you know, to uh, pay for all that needs to be done in now nine colleges and two seminaries. So, yeah, generally uh, it, it does go for mission and evangelism, education, and, and that sort of thing to, I would say, again, world missions is, is financed primarily these days through, um, I, I, would, I would say, more personal missionary support. That is, some of you get letters to support missionaries, you know, and so there are LWMLs and there are individuals and individual congregations that are paying to support specific um, missionaries of our Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and that's that's through a program called Together in Mission and that too is something our district is doing you might know that this is an extra kind of mission giving that some congregations get involved in in our district that is they send in a little extra to our office in Sioux Falls and we are then supporting uh, Daniel Jastrom who is a missionary in Southeast Asia and uh, we had been uh, supporting David Warner, a missionary in Spain, but he's just returned home. So our, our uh, support is now going uh, totally toward Daniel Jastrow. But it's that kind of a program now, kind of more individualized giving for, for international mission that's going on. Like missionaries raising their own support is another way of saying it. And individuals, congregations, LWML groups, uh, sometimes church districts, um, helping to fund them. Okay? Other questions? Uh, expand campus ministry. I see so you got SESU and USD. There's campus ministries there, but can we expand that at all? Yeah, expanding campus ministry. So right now we are supporting our two, in terms of the district, some of your dollars going to uh, specifically toward our campus ministries at USD, and that would be Concordia Lutheran Church and Reverend Paul Elvers, a young man, and then the SDSU ministry, that's through Mount Calvary in Brookings, and that's chiefly Reverend Micah Bauer. Uh, can we expand this more? Well, we could, we could, but we also are finding out um, that Certainly, individual congregations are, are doing some of this ministry, and I, know, I don't know if, if St. Paul's is doing any campus ministry per se. I know that students come here to church once in a while, but um, it's been a while. We used to, as a district, help to fund outreach at Northern, but we haven't done that for a while. And, uh, and we, we haven't had a, a big request to do that, and of course, then it would take funding to do that too. And uh, so I would say we're not unwilling to do that, but we'd have to, I believe, collaborate with local congregations to do that ministry, as we are doing at, in, in Vermilion and in Brookings. We are collaborating with congregations. So I don't know that Mount Calvary, who has two pastors, would have two pastors without the district support that, again, all of us are giving. Uh, but then he can, you know, he can give 
specific time to campus ministry. So, yeah, um, you know, we, in other campuses throughout South Dakota, such as uh, Black Hill State, for that congregation out there, St. Paul's, was pretty active on its own in campus ministry there. Well, that's probably one reason why Pastor Bobby's sitting in this room today. Would you be here without that, that ministry at St. Paul's? St. Paul's in, in uh, Spearfish. Good old Pastor Bowman, right. So, but we never gave a penny in support to that ministry at that time. It just, it's what congregations also want to do. So, are we open to exploring a, a bigger partnership with any congregations in places like Aberdeen and Yankton, Spearfish, Madison, Mitchell? Sure, sure. Put forth a, an overture to the convention and see, see where it goes. Never know. You never know. So there's a route, you know, if we want to uh, try to, to do more together uh, and encourage, you know, walk alongside a congregation in a bigger way financially. There's, there's maybe some ways, that, there are some ways of doing that. But so far and for a long time, we have chosen to concentrate on our largest, our largest universities. Yeah, there's a need. There's needs all around, aren't there? Opportunities. Opportunities all around. Okay, thank you. It's kind of like a little district convention going on here now. You're warming me up for that. Thank you, man. Got more than I bargained for coming here to St. Paul's. Okay, let's let's study. Study the scripture. Matthew chapter 25. And uh, there's a... The handout, and there's, I know there's some who came in later, there's a green handout, but some are white. It's the same thing with like a stair steps. This is, really it's a reference to the Lutheran, well, the scriptural understanding of, as it says here, of our passage from this life to the next. And what I've done there is to give you uh, various Bible passages and, and so you can, you know, have this as a reference for yourself. But uh, it does fit in with where I want to go with uh, the Matthew chapter 25 study today, and especially beginning at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. By the way, who's the Son of Man? Jesus. Yeah, Jesus Christ. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Let's pray as we continue. Heavenly Father, these are challenging words, but words you have given and why they are in red in our Bibles. 
Thank you for these words of truth. Help us in a topic that maybe we don't think about enough, uh, the second coming of, of Jesus, to uh, consider this, consider it seriously today, and to rejoice in the outcome that you promise for us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So in chapter 24 of St. Matthew, generally that's about signs that Christ is coming, and there are all kinds of signs. There are, uh, you know, first of all, one of the signs is the gospel is to be preached in all the world, that sign. And then there are the, uh, the, the natural disaster signs, which include, by the way, pestilence. We're getting pestilence right now. And it also includes, well, along with pestilence, would be tornadoes and droughts and hurricanes and things like that. And then, then comes the persecution kind of signs, persecution of God's people. So would you say we are in the last days, in the end times? Yes, we are. We are. And things are supposed to heat up a little bit more toward the very end, according to Scripture, too. And I don't know. It's hard for us to know if we're there. Uh, because there have been other generations of Christians, Christians who have thought, it must be time. It must be time. When is that trumpet going to blow, you know? Because, as it turns out, these signs of the end times have been here really since Christ set foot on this earth and then ascended into heaven. So we have been in end times since then. All right? And, uh, but anyway, chapter 24 of Matthew generally talks about that. Chapter 25 begins with such things as the parable of the ten virgins. And so as, you know, to, to watch, to watch for the second coming of the king. And then here toward the end of chapter 25 of Matthew, we get his actual coming, his return to this earth, and, uh, and then to be that, that, have that separation of the righteous from the unrighteous, okay? So this is where it's, it, it's going. Just a few comments about this specific text. I would say, you know, son of man, when you hear that, that's a common designation for Jesus. In fact, it's the, the most common one that he used of himself. He didn't say, well, hi, I'm Jesus, a lot. Well, I don't know, I wasn't there, but in terms of what we have in the scriptures, it's Son of Man, Son of Man. It's, and that's a reference, of course, to humanity, but it's really also at the same time a, uh, a divine designation. And it does point us back to the, the book of Daniel where the Son of Man is there in his glory. And, and so Jesus is tying in that that reference there, the mighty Son of Man in Old Testament, is Jesus. So, so yeah, this is a reference to certainly God in flesh, divinity, uh, assuming humanity in one person. Well, he is the mighty Son of Man and the gentle Son of Man, right? So you have that, um, you have, and that's in verse... 31, of course, and you have glory going on, and, and glory, I don't know, that's some, somewhat difficult to define. Sometimes I've heard glory defined as God's holiness being brought down so that it can be, so that humans can, can, can at least um, face the holiness of God. But it's still pretty bright because we have the glory of God happening where, for example, there were these angels, and then there were these shepherds. The glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid, weren't they? So, again, God bringing his holiness into, into proximity with humanity. And it's a bright thing when that happens. And here we have the glory of God. I mean, and it, it, it's, it's a whole lot more than that, but it is kind of the sum of the divine attributes of God in their unrestricted exercise. I mean, this is God, this is Jesus showing that he is indeed divine. He did that, well, where else can you remember in the New Testament where Jesus manifested his glory, that beyond a doubt, this was God in human flesh. 
because there was even physical evidence. Things changed around him. Transfiguration. transfiguration, yes. The transfiguration is what I was thinking of too. That's where glorious Jesus was, was, also, was also evident. Okay. Uh, angels. They do a couple of things here. Uh, here in verse 31. The angels are with him. Well, they're not doing much there yet, are they? In verse 31. Except, it says, though they are forming his train. And so it's like Jesus is appearing in the sky. We don't have that specifically here. But his angels are like backing him up. I mean, millions of angels are, are there. But what is the other thing that these angels get to do here in Matthew chapter 25 in this little section that we've read? Do they have any other, other job? Maybe it's not specific, specifically said here. Other places, they're part of the gatherers of the people, you know, uh, of gathering all the nations together. So they, uh, they're part of the, the victory entrance of our Lord back to this earth, but then they're also part of the gatherers of humanity. And that's not here specifically, but there are some references, uh, for example, in Matthew chapter uh, 13, First, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8 as another example. Notice that it's all the nations. Verse 32. All the nations. So, this does not limit this in any way. I mean, this is all people. And we know, too, that by this, you know, there's also going to be the as we, we say, as we hear in the sermon today, the resurrection of all flesh is happening too. So you have all the, the people who are, are currently living when Christ returns, and that could be you and me. Could be, right? And uh, it's also the, uh, the ones that will be raised from the dead, which a lot of people from over time, right? So all of this is going to go on. So there's a lot of gathering that has to be made, and there are going to be a lot of sheep and a lot of goats, right? And so uh, notice, what about the timing? So Jesus commends the faithful for their good works. And they're really, you have to say, quite simple good works, aren't they? What's the timing of the separation of the sheep from the goats and Jesus naming the good works of the faithful? What, what, what comes first? Separation. The separation. Why is that significant? Before there's any... I'm going to have you complete the sentence. Before there's any mention of good works, there is... Well, there's separation, isn't there? So, on what basis then are the sheep who are called the righteous on the king's right? And on what basis are the, the goats who are called the unrighteous on his left? What is the, the factor for, one, for them being on one side or the other? Faith in Jesus Christ, Faith in Jesus Christ. absolutely. It's not here. Uh, but they're called the righteous. They're called the righteous. And this is where we, you know, we have to do a little exploration into all the scripture. And, you know, by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the work of God. Not of works, lest any of, any of us should boast, right? And so scripture in, in the Old Testament and New Testament is replete with references that in fact... Yeah, it's, it's God's grace that saves. And it's on the basis of God-given faith. And at, that's before any works are mentioned. Got it? Then comes the mention. Then comes the mentioning of the good works. Yeah. Now, and we could talk more about sheep and goats. You know, why, 
there's a lot of goat fans, maybe some in this room. Uh, and there's a lot of sheep fans, maybe some in this room. Uh, and I, then now I'm talking about maybe some of you have raised sheep, and maybe some of you have raised goats. And there's problems with each. I, I've been to my grandpa's farm in Hebron, North Dakota, home of the brickmakers, Hebron Brick. Their teams are called the brickmakers, you see. Um, anyway. And, and, and my, my uh, grandparents had dumb goats. Well, they, they were smart goats. They were smart elec goats because they would stand, stand on top of our cars. <laughs> Stuff like that, you know? But sheep, they, they have their own problems. And you've heard endless sermons about, about sheep and maybe even some about goats. But the thing about goats is they are far more self-reliant, aren't they? And so they would be far more self-righteous in terms of compar the comparison of sheep. Sheep are the needy ones. That's you and me, isn't it? Sheep are the ones who need the care of a good shepherd. Goats do their own thing. They even stand in your car. So um, that's just the way it is. So I do think you know there's something to that, and we can kind of relate uh, even today with um, the comparison and how these animals act. act. Uh, verse 33, a little more here. And by the way, how long do we go with this thing? Until that, that terrible bell rings again? <laughs> Is that the sign? It'll ring. Okay. Well, good. I think. See, I have hearing aids, and man, is that thing close to my hearing aids. I, I, I really wasn't sure what was going on there. I just, yeah. Okay. So you're, you're a grandparents live in North Dakota? Yes, uh, I was, I'm from southwestern North Dakota, down the south part, near Dickinson. Did they come to visit you? Well, my, my grandparents aren't gone. I know. I was just, I was going there was that if you're from the wilderness, once you get into South Dakota, which is, you know, the paradise, how do you go back? I, the only good thing to come out of South Dakota was Highway 281. Oh. <laughs> Are you from the Are you North Dakota? Dakota? Absolutely. St. Teresa Telephone Bowl? Oh, I know. <laughs> You can watch a dog run away for three days up there. Well, we have a lot of fun here. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Hey, I, I've been on that long ribbon of road between... Um, Butte, what Butte did we just climb the other? Bear Butte. Bear Butte and Riva, South Dakota. Oh. On the way, like, through bowman north dakota and to my home in near dickinson there so i i've seen south dakota you can see dogs on the way for five miles up there. <laughs> yeah anyway 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 you couldn't let that one go um so verse 33 though he'll place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left the question now i don't know if you've thought of this question though but this one could be asked by you. Is it not true that when a person dies, his, pers his soul immediately enters heaven or hell? Isn't that true? Yes. It is true. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's, there's, I've, I've tried to point that out on that little stair step thing that I gave you, that, that hand out there. It is true. And so it's true that there are actually then two judgments. The first is when a person physically dies. And it's at that time that a person's soul is either with the Lord or already in hell. So then we have this judgment, which you will also, so it, it's likely though, well it's likely that you and I will be among those who are in graves when Christ comes again. I don't know, don't know. But it, it could be that way. I mean, that's the way it is for my grandparents. My, my parents are still alive. Sarah's are still alive. Um, but um, it, it could be that, that we, in a sense, face two judgments. The first one is the one that, that, that certainly uh, 
<laughs> well, it sticks. I mean, it is the way it's going to be for you. You are going to be with the Lord. And, I mean, there's, there's scriptural evidence for that, isn't, isn't there? Thief on the cross, right? Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Right. Uh, Stephen, as he was, was uh, stoned, Acts chapter 7, he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Okay? So this is an immediacy of being with the Lord. And that's why when I had the funeral on Thursday at Memorial Lutheran in Sioux Falls, because their two pastors have COVID, don't want to have a COVID pastor leading the funeral. Um, well, I was able to assure the family that Betty was with the Lord. I happen to have known Betty from serving her mother, <laughs> burying her mother at age 101. Uh, like 16 years ago. So I just knew this family and I, I knew of Betty's faith in the Lord. Um, St. Paul desires to be with Christ, right? He says in, in Philippians, for example, and he adds that that would be far better. But for me to live is Christ, to die is gain, he says. So he knew that if, Paul knew that if he were to gain, uh, die before all the ministry he wanted to do with the Philippians, it would be good for him. He'd be with the Lord. But it would be better on your account, he would say, if I'm still with you. So there's so much scriptural evidence that when we die, and there's a little more I could bring to you, is in effect the first judgment. This second one, then, what, what's it about? Well, it's about showing, basically it's about showing the good works of the sheep. It's, it's really not so much a judgment as it is a, a display, a display of the, 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 the wonderful faith relationship that the sheep have had with the King, Jesus Christ, and the way their lives have reflected um, his goodness to the world, the way that their lives have been conduits of his blessing in this world. Even when they would say, Lord, when do we do these things? I don't remember serving you. But the answer is telling, isn't it? When you've done it to, leave, to the least of these brothers of mine, you've done it to me. So this means, brothers and sisters in Christ, when, when you as mothers fed those screaming babies or that husband of yours or, or that husband of yours uh, Jesus counts that as a good work as though done to him I mean little babies are hungry and that big baby your husband is also hungry so I mean I think it's it's telling that Jesus uses the word Brothers. He's not saying neighbors, uh, you know, not, though that is a good work too. So it's, it's like he's confining the good works that, that are being mentioned here, uh, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, etc. Uh, even visiting folks in jail, he's calling them brothers, which is usually, I mean, I, maybe there are references in, in the New Testament that the word brother is outside the Christian community. So you know what I'm talking about? I, I call you brothers and sisters in Christ. And Jesus is saying, when you've done it to the least of these brothers of mine. So it's, at least I'm, I'm seeing this that as, um, as a reference to the good works that we do within the community of faith, which includes our own families. So, uh, you know, Luther, had a lot to say about that. But I mean, our good works extend beyond and need to extend beyond our families too. The scripture compels us to do that um, as well. You know, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. And, and this is, I, I take that to mean the world, you know, outside the brethren and the sisters. So just something to think about. But what a wonderful declaration by our God, by Jesus here. Because, I mean, he's saying that, that we serve the God that we can't see by serving people whom we can see. 
Isn't that amazing? We've done it to him. We've done it to him. Uh, and so Luther would make comments like, um, God himself milks cows to those who milk cows. So God is extending his care into the world through people is, is, the, is the point here. And Jesus is then giving to that kind of common labor, uh, common good works, uh, the designation, you've done it to me. You've done it to me too. So I think that's wild and I think it's, it's wonderful. Um, let me read you what um, Martin Luther has a quote here. Because I think sometimes we think, all right, to serve God, we have to do it in a, a certain way. You know, it's got to be big. Maybe Pastor Bobby serves God, but I don't know if I do. You know, you might be saying. Um, <clears throat> of course, in Luther's day, that was the view. It was those who were involved as, as, you know, the priests and those that were in the convents and the monasteries that were the real servants of God. And Luther said, <laughs> you're joking when you think that. He, he says, no, God works through Christians, through the saints. They are serving God. So Luther at one point wrote, Who could have ever discerned that God lets himself so low that he receives all these works which we do to the poor and needy as if we had done it to him? Thus the world is full of God. In every yard, in every lane, you find Christ. Do not gaze up into the sky and say, if I could but once see our Lord God, how readily I would render him any service in my power. You are a liar, Luther says. Listen, thou wretched man. Do you wish to serve God? You have him in your home with your servants and children. Teach them to fear God and put their trust in him alone and love them. Then he says, go and comfort your sad and sick neighbors. Help them with all your possessions, wisdom, and skill. So, you know, Luther extends the, the umbrella, the reach of our good works within our own homes, but outside our homes too. And we would say, well, yes, yes. But I still, I find it intriguing that, Lord, that our Lord Jesus says, as you've done it to the least of these brothers. And... and uh, Pastor Bobby, if you have any insights. I, I didn't read Jeff Gibbs' commentary on that, so I bet he's got something great to say. Well, I was thinking earlier when Pastor about Lazarus and Jesus' story about Lazarus and the rich man. Okay. Yeah, you know, Lazarus has, has faith. That's, that would be a brother of Christ, but, you know. Right. Who's that? That brother of the association, the sister of the association of Christ. Mm -hmm. We might have look. I know Christians who go to jail. <laughs> you know, yeah. their faith is strong. They just don't always make good decisions. Uh, yeah, so that's it's, it's very potent uh, uh, reference, I think. Mean. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't, of course, it doesn't mean that we don't serve our, our neighbor, because that is maybe those outside the Christian faith, because we have all kinds of evidence that, oh, God loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, and we are to be his, his gospel ambassadors to all the world. The church exists primarily, well, partly for itself. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but also exists to go and make disciples of all nations, right? So we do both. We love those within the body. We love those outside the body. That's our mission. Okay. But what do you think is more natural? To see Christ in your brother your fellow Christian, your spouse, your kids, your teenagers, to see Christ in them or see the devil in them? Because what? we're sinners, we normally see the devil in Because we're sinners, we normally see the devil in him. But isn't he a dear little devil? Yes, he is. Yeah. 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 Well, we do. We... We, 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 tend to, we tend to do that, don't we? Uh, but to remember that, that uh, the people around us are, are people for whom Christ died. And uh, 
That makes all the difference, doesn't it? But I, the temptation, though, is to, to see what's bad in one another rather than what, that, to, then to see Christ in them. Doesn't the word, isn't the Christian, word Christian defined as little Christ? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it, it's in, on one hand, it sounds, uh, you know, it sounds almost blasphemous to say that there's Christ you know, in, in, well, Jesus says it, though, so it's not. But to say, you know, in serving you, I'm serving Christ. That, that sounds, sounds weird, doesn't it? But this is really the truth. Um, we are Christ's hands and feet, his voice in this world. Okay. <laughs> what else do we want to say about that? There's a lot we could say. But it's interesting that, okay, that only the good works are mentioned. Now, this is, Scripture talks in a couple of ways, I think, and I need to find some references. And I know I'm talking about, okay, like, the, like, like Christ the judge opens his book and he points out your good things, but he points out your, your sins. You know, all of our works will be revealed, right? So there's, there are some scripture passages that, that kind of sound like that, but then there are passages um, that, uh, that make it sound more like what we just said here in Matthew chapter 25, that the, the good works of the, the sheep are the ones that are mentioned. I mean, let's talk about that just for a moment. I'm thinking of a passage in the Psalms that, you know, God removes our sins as far as the east is from the west and that he remembers them no more. You believe that? You believe that, that God remembers our sins no more? Well, he says it. He says it. Um, and this passage from Matthew chapter 25 then, where Christ puts forth the, the good deeds that we've done as evidence of our faith um, falls in line with that. But then there are there are some passages, and I, I have them here someplace, where it uh, you know sounds a little more as as though the bad stuff will be there too. Well, all I know is that that God, through faith in Jesus Christ declares you holy, doesn't he? Without sin. And, and I, I believe that God remembers our sins to the extent that, um, well, he's, he's not like some forgetful old guy. But he remembers them, uh, he won't remember them, that is, he won't bring them up as a matter of judgment against you anymore, is what the thing is here. And so on that last day, and again, this reading from Matthew chapter 25 sounds like that, there could be a lot of things Christ could say about you, but he won't say it because they've already been drowned in the depths of the sea. They've already been removed as far as the east is from the west. Uh, Christ's righteousness counts for your unrighteousness. So for all the, the times Jesus kept the uh, third commandment, uh, remember the Sabbath day, counts for you when maybe you skipped church, when you didn't have to skip church. I did once when um, I was a kid. It wasn't when I was pastor. Um, but uh, the Vikings were on early. Okay? And I really wanted to watch the Vikings. You're it's, forgiven. I'm forgiven. <laughs> and I, man, did I I fake the biggest kind of whatever, you know, I don't think I threw up, but I, I tried the best I could to throw up just so I could stay home. That's pretty bad, you have to say. But for all the times that I did stuff like that or didn't honor the Word of God as I ought, Christ did. And it counts for me. It counts for you. For all the times that maybe I didn't listen to my parents or tried to fake them out by being pretending I was sick, uh, Jesus didn't do that kind of stuff. He... Uh, he kept the fourth commandment, and it counts for you, and so on down the commandments. 
So I, I mean, I am so confident that when Christ comes again, that I will be among the sheep. Just because Christ is so gracious. Not because I'm good, but because he's good. Right? We can have confidence. Because he is risen from the dead, you are going to be raised from the dead. He promises. So I have, you know, all the confidence given by God that, that I could have uh, about where I'll, where I'll stand uh, among the, you know, the righteous on the last day. Well, let's, let's have you ask your questions. I've, uh, I'm afraid of that bell, and I think it's going to happen pretty soon. <laughs> I think we have about eight minutes. And you've seen the sheet. Or, uh, well, and if you haven't, please pick up one of these green sheets up here because it gives you <clears throat> kind of what's all going to happen. I, and I guess in reference to this, you know, all these stair steps, a lot is going to be happening close to the same time. That is Christ's second coming, his raising of the dead, the uh, passing away of heaven and earth, the judgment and then the new heaven and earth that kind of as i understand as much as i can understand this this is going to happen pretty pretty quickly or at the same you know one after the other it's not like waiting around for him to return the second time here but this is this is going to happen well we'll have to see how it happens how it all plays out when christ comes again but these are events let's just say on the same day, um, ushered in by the second coming of Christ. It's also true that eternal life has already begun for you. Did you know that? You know, when you come to faith, you've already, eternal life has begun. Uh, it's still though, you bear the burdens of this world. You're still, it's not, you know, you don't have that new body yet. You're not with the Lord face to face yet but you know it's coming. So by faith, you know that uh, the new life, the new heavens, new earth that's, that's promised is, is yet to come. This earth is okay, the new one's better. This body is all right, the new and glorious one is going to be better. So there's a now, not yet dimension to our faith too, isn't there? We don't have it all yet. We don't have it all in terms of everything God wants to do for you to restore his creation, to restore you to what he wants you to be forever. Okay, your questions. And Pastor Bobby, you, you'll be a fellow question answerer with me. I, I might need help. I just, I'm, I'm anticipating. What kind of questions do you have? And I didn't cover absolutely everything here. When it talks about the new heaven and earth, is that combined? Or is that... Yeah, new heaven and new earth. Well, th this is where we, we go back to the beginning of time, right? Where God made the earth, and it was, it was intended to be, the, uh, to be paradise the place where his people would live. And, uh, and and so, yeah, you know, there's this, and right now, you know, there is the heaven where, where God dwells with the angels and his saints. Um, yeah, but there's sort of this bringing together is the way I read the scriptures here, that is, uh, recreating this earth to be the paradise, so kind of, it, it will be heaven on earth again. A remade earth. And, uh, and, and, you know, where there will be no sin again. We will not fall again. But we will be forever um, righteous and forever with our Lord. So it's a very physical thing. God wants not to not only renew our bodies so that they are are, are new and glorious, better than ever bodies, never to get sick again, never to die again. But he wants to make this earth the same way, never to feel the effects of sin again. Romans chapter 8, all of creation is groaning with the pains of childbirth, the scripture says. 
waiting, actually waiting for this last day when Christ is going to do this. So right now there's a, there's a separation of heaven, heaven and earth, wherever heaven is. It's a, apart from this earth. But there, yeah, on the last day, you have the sense of God bringing it all back together again. Righteous, wonderful. Um, where are you going to live forever? Yeah. Yes? So in three minutes, can you give the short version of the misconceptions of the rapture? <clears throat> well, <laughs> well, yeah. It, so on those sheets, you know, the Bible doesn't say much about the rapture, and we should really, we should really go uh, to where, what it does say there. Is that First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians chapter four? Yeah. So there's this resurrection. <clears throat> so the very middle step there on this sheet, mine is white, yours is green, or some of yours are white maybe. Um, you have the, the, the raising of our bodies, and, uh, and then the rapture follows. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4, I think, is, along with 2 Corinthians 15, are the, the clearest passages on this. So the Bible doesn't say a ton about this. Of course, the, the false view of this would be, this gets into what we call millennialism. Um, Christ is going to... Test, test, test. Am I still on? Yeah. Christ is going to return, maybe secretly, and establish his kingdom on earth again. Um, there's going to be a removal of, of believers because there's this, you know, warfare that's going to go on at Armageddon. Uh, the believers will be raptured out of it so they don't have to face this. I'm kind of muddling this a little bit. but So that's one of the false views. I mean, we say we are in the end times. We say we're in this battle right now with Satan and his forces. Scripture says that. Um, some, some uh, as they read Revelation, um, will we'll say it, will define this all in a different way. But our Lutheran understanding here is, is certainly that this is all a part of the last day. Rapture means removal. And we're going to join... God's saints that are already uh, with him in heaven, we won't, uh, and, and uh, well, let's look at it. <laughs> I'm stumbling around here. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 4. <clears throat> but I think you have the sense that God wants to remove us through the rapture so he can go to work on planet Earth, so he can remake this, this earth to be a, a, a suitable habitation for us, us again. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry, voice of archangels, sound of trumpet, dead in Christ will rise first. So he's going to bring them out of their graves. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we'll always be with the Lord. All right? So there you have it. That's the rapture. It seems like it's a, a brief thing that happens so that we are with the Lord. He's protecting us so he can go on to recreate the world that he wants to recreate, to be like it was meant to be. And then place us back there with him. There it is. Amen. All right. Thank you all.